I do believe that in the long run, we will have to fare into space. You know, th- this planet has a limited lifetime. Basically, much of the history of AI is we, we believe some things are hard and they turn out to be easy and things that we think are easy turn out to be hard. Is we really bad judges. It's terrible. Of how we think or oh, <laughs> what is hard and what is easy. This is Brain Inspired. Hello, everyone. This is Paul Middlebrooks. You just heard Nando de Freitas, a longtime machine learning practitioner and one of the first, if not the first person, to record his lectures on machine learning and post them for free on YouTube, which have been viewed and appreciated by many, many people. Uh, So it's a really great service that he provided. Like a previous brain-inspired guest, uh, Matt Botvinnik, from episode 21, Nando is at DeepMind, and he also has an appointment at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, CIFAR. Unlike Matt, my previous guest, Nando's background and general thought process is definitely on the AI side of the neuroscience AI spectrum. As most of you know, my guests have tended to be heavy on the neuroscience side, so it was fun and enlightening to hear Nando's take on everything. I will continue to invite guests more on the AI side of things, which has always been a goal. It just hasn't worked out like that yet. On the show today, we talk about Nando's principled reasons for studying AI in the first place, why he thinks To understand our minds, it's worth studying both single agents and multi-agents, his balanced view of being inspired by neuroscience, but also influenced by engineering concerns when developing AI systems, and uh, what it looks like through his eyes to observe neuroscientists in their native environments doing neuroscience experiments. (laughs) Uh, We touch on a couple of the topics that he researches, but We don't dive deep into any one area, Um, so I will put a host of his recent papers that are relevant to our discussion in the show notes for you to find and enjoy. They cover a range of topics, including meta-learning, which we talk about some in the show. Uh, He works on few-shot and one-shot AI agents, uh, which are agents that can learn things with just a few or one uh, example, respectively. So a classic problem with modern deep learning is the ungodly amount of data examples that a network requires to learn. Uh, So his work addresses that problem. He also works on something called neural program interpreters, uh, which are programs that learn how to represent and execute other programs. So he's all over the place if that place is the forefront of modern machine learning research. Like I said, I will link to all of that in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 40. If you like the show, you can support it on Patreon. I'll tell you more about that later. But you can also help by simply telling a friend. And thank you in advance for that. I even had someone email me and tell me they plan to use the show as a sort of journal club for one of their courses. So that was delightfully terrifying. One note before we start. I had to record this episode with an unusual recording setup, so apologies that my audio is less than stellar. You know who is stellar? This person. Nando, thank you for being on the show and welcome. Thank you. So you are a busy person. You're a principal scientist at DeepMind, and uh, you have an appointment at the renowned Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, otherwise known as CIFAR. But what I really want to know uh, is how different your life is now compared to how you envisioned it when you were growing up in Africa without running water or electricity under the uh, apartheid. Actually, um, I I was born in Africa and I did spend my early years in Africa. Um, But when I encountered having no water and electricity was in Europe. Oh, is that right? That's correct. Oh, I heard incorrectly. Uh, in Madeira Island, part of Portugal, uh, when I lived there, there was no water, actually, for four years that I was there. And uh, there was no electricity at the beginning. Eventually, you know, like all houses started getting light. Mm. So modernity didn't get to Europe that long ago, or at least not to all of Europe. 
And I mean, so yeah, I, I certainly didn't dream of being a deep mind in those days. <laughs> I was just a happy, uh, you know, happy child, uh, content with uh, the things around. <laughs> well, I guess you definitely didn't have Atari games, but you could have been playing chess and Go for all I know. No, I actually always, what I found the always the most entertaining was to be in nature mm. and to play with you know ants and so on and to see how things work and understand how wasps build their nests and how they you know their whole life cycle and so on. That's always what fascinated me. Life. That's great. Well, you have come a long way, and you've been in the machine learning world for a long time now. Uh, you even have some of the I think some of the earliest uh, courses that you made available, just your lectures on some machine learning and deep learning, and I'll link to those in the show notes because they're excellent. And of course, they've been viewed. Everyone's probably already already knows about them. Everyone listening to the podcast. Thank you. Uh, but you're, you've talked about your reasons for working on AI, and you, you've sort of given three reasons. And I just kind of want to walk through those and, and talk about them for a second. So one is enlightenment and understanding how our brains work. Um, and I. I don't. I mean this in the nicest way possible. Why not study brains then? Well, I do mean brains, but I, but but I don't think we should be thinking of only like say the brain of one creature. The whole human race can be understood as one brain. It's a collective brain, mm -hmm. and it's also very interesting to understand that. And also because. For me, the concept of mind uh, goes beyond just what's inside your head. So, for example, I don't remember the phone of my girlfriend, the phone number. So I, I have to rely on my, you know, to have annoyment, sure. of course. But I, I do rely on mobile device. And, and there's a particular motor command that I execute that I've memorized that retrieves that information. So my mind is now being externalized into the devices that surround me. And in fact, it's externalized in people as well. I rely on people to answer. I, I know that with some people, if I ask them a question, they will answer it. So I take advantage of that. Yeah. Uh, so in yeah. the sense, I think mind is a broader concept than just what's inside your head. So are you a hardline extended cognition thinker then uh, in the you know domain of Andy Clark and folks like that who... You know, is this more of a concept or is it a real thing that our, our cognition is extended into, in our minds are extended into a broader scope like that? Yeah, I don't know if I would put myself in the group of uh, those amazing uh, philosophers. <laughs> I don't feel I qualified to be there, but I certainly, from a practical perspective, for me, the division, the boundary of what makes an agent is not a clear one. And this transpires very clearly in the research that we do as well. When we treat, when we build some neural networks for multi-agent research, but quite often you can look at it from afar and you see, okay, this is just one single neural network. And you can think of communication between agents as, well, this is just a part of the network sending information to another part of the network, right. which is no different than a single, what we do in a single network. So... The divisions are not clear, and hence I think it's important to to study both multi-agents and single agents. I think they just give us different perspectives on how to approach the problem. I also think that uh, to address some of the important problems that we face um, in society, like uh, you know e economic problems, uh, um, making sure that everyone has a reasonable income and uh, and so on we need to actually understand society so we need to understand groups of brains ultimately not just a single brain mm. yeah so that's an important reason for doing it and in, mo in motor control it's also useful because uh, in terms of storage i don't um, i think that's a very useful trick that i don't have to remember everyone's phone <laughs> what i remember is a a a key and i remember a set of motor controls such that when I execute the motor control and my fingers start touching the phone, I know that I will encounter information along the way that will guide the next sequence of motor controls and so on. Mm. And, and that, to me, is a much more parsimonious way of storing information 
than if I were storing everything that's on my phone in uh, you know in my head. Um, so in that sense, I think it's uh, I'm. I, I, I'd say I am with Andy Clark and so on and the externals and all that, but in a very pragmatic way. Yeah. Gosh, there are just so many points. I just wanted to go down the road there and diverge because, you know, this takes us back all the way to the ancient Greeks about uh, language and how it's going to ruin us versus whether it's helpful to write things down because it'll either ruin our memory or it'll help us encode the information <laughs> moving forward. So, so, all right, let's skip that for now. But understanding the social uh, aspect, lots of brains together, brings me to your second reason or a second reason uh, for why you have said that you study AI and that's compassion and that's um, you know understanding and encouraging empathy and you, you've stated that machines are going to need compassion as we build them I don't know if you want to comment further on that yeah I mean I think that's self-evident it's I don't think we understand well how to bring all the, the the richness of emotive systems that humans and other animals have into machines. There have been some attempts, but I feel like um, often they have been, um, you know, very simple, hard-coded uh, rules as to what happiness right. is or what sadness is for a small agent in an environment. So I think we are very far from understanding all the rich uh, emotional system or the, the uh, the rich set of neurotransmitters and so on in the brain and different parts of the brain that are responsible for in the brain and the nervous system in general that are responsible uh, for emotions. So from that perspective, I do think we need to do a lot more research. There's two goals here. One is to do research in emotive systems to understand better what we are, you know, to understand humanity better and to, to understand that other animals better. And I think in that understanding, compassion ar arises in two ways. It, it will allow us to see that, for example, oh my God, this dog has this very rich emotional system. Not mine. Uh, it's capable of sadness and happiness. <laughs> so maybe my dog certainly is. He's <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. Just very sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and that allows us to relate better to other animals and so on. Um, so I think that's part of that discovery process. But it also, that same compassion that I wouldn't have toward my dog and that I hope you have toward yours, <laughs> is the compassion that I would like machines to have toward me. Mm. So I think if we're building artificial intelligence systems, and if we want to build general artificial intelligence systems, uh, to me there's still a question as to whether we want to do that or not. But if we do, then I think compassion is a must. Um, they need to be able to empathize with us and uh, be compassionate. So when I was in, early in my college undergraduate career, my, my friend and I were, it was late at night and we were sitting on his uh, front steps and we were talking about the future of humanity taking, and, and the future of earth. And his take was that we are ruining the earth as we know it, you know, the rainforests are disappearing and such. Uh, and we need to figure out how to fix our problems here. We need to figure out how to not destroy the earth uh, before we do what I thought was important, which was colonize space. Get off this planet because we're going to crowd it and we need to figure that out. There's going to be so many problems. We've got to figure it out as fast as possible. Uh, at the time, I didn't think about it, but these two are not mutually exclusive ideas, which brings me to your third reason mm -hmm. uh, for studying AI, which is uh, the one that really seems to get people these days is survival. Uh, that we have to, A, get off the planet uh, and B, make the planet last longer. Uh, because there is a, a limited time. Uh, yes. So, so I do believe that if you think about existential crisis and AI, I do believe that in the long run, we will have to fare into space. You know, th this planet has a limited lifetime. It's a huge one. So probably a lot of things could go wrong <laughs> uh, in the time that the solar system will exist. But we know that there's an upper bound there. And we know that if we don't develop AI systems and robots that can build uh, sustainable life systems for life in space, uh, we will be in trouble. Robots can sort of fare into space. We know this because we send robots to Mars, but it's very hard to send people to Mars. Mm -hmm. 
And so developing autonomous agents that are capable of building, you know, life preserving cities, I think in space, it, it will become important in in a very distant future. There is, uh, and here I guess one has to bring in some speculation. You know, phys- if you talk to physicists, they'll tell you about meteorites that could hit the Earth. Yes. Uh, they have hit us before. They could hit us again. And, you know, folks talk about super volcanoes and so on. So, so there's there's clear threats. I mean, these are very unlikely events, but we know that in a hundred million years, uh, again, there's upper bounds right. as to. So ultimately, for the survival of life, so that we can have any hope of perhaps meeting other species in the universe. And then our only chance is to uh, develop AI. Of course, I also think in the shorter run, better AI um, systems, better statistics, better machine learning, basically, is what I'm referring to as AI here, will also enable us to understand better uh, what I'd say, the, the weather conditions, to be able to uh, understand how be able to monitor the planet better so we can make more intelligent decisions about our, the resources in our planet. So I think that's um, about how to, to or give us guidance on how to manage energy or maybe help us develop uh, new ways of uh, um, you know, coming up with uh, friendly types of energy sources that, you know, that will enable us to then be much more sustainable. So it's clear that we are in a pickle now with where the human race is and the planet and so on. And the way ahead, uh, one of the ways ahead is by trusting technology. Okay, so in general, on the podcast, I have interviewed people heavily on the neuroscience side between the, the two facets of neuroscience and let's say AI or machine learning. Uh, You are a great example of someone who is, I would say, deep on the machine learning or AI side, but but you also had this deep interest in understanding brains, and forgive the pun saying deep, of course. And you have reminded people on multiple occasions that our current AI systems were dreamt up from early neuroscience experiments, like from Hubel and Wiesel. However, we do all know that how, how divorced dreams can be from reality. Uh, and some of the best dreams are some of the most fantastical and least realistic. So um, where would you put yourself on the scale between pure AI and pure neuro if, the, if they were clear distinctions? And maybe you can answer uh, independently for your sort of daily workflow practice and just your mindset. So I'm definitely not a neuroscientist. I'm more of um, a, uh, a dreamer <laughs> or... Uh, a creator of uh, ideas and I sort of steer people to sort of create ideas and so on and develop, uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know, sort of push the, the, the boundary of what, what exists in, in the world of AI. Um, I'm very interested in getting to know some of the, the things we have struggled with in the past, things like well, awareness, how, how does an agent know what it knows? Mm-hmm. Or how does an agent know what it doesn't know? Um, th- this kind of question that we're so far from resolving you know, with our current systems. I'm also interested in perception, which is, I still think, highly unsolved, and motor control, which is also unsolved, uh, you know, and a, and a multitude of problems. For all these, I always find it useful to go and read papers in neuroscience and papers in cognitive science, because they inform you know my thinking and mm. uh, and what things we can do of course i'm also informed by engineering um, i know i can store in a machine all the data that a human perceives in their lifetime right and so um all the pixels all the pixels and not, not just the pixels the skin sensation the temperature the, sound, the type yeah. and so on uh which is which are signals that are just as rich as the pixels I think there's an obsession with pixels because that's kind of where tech has gone. Well, I just but, was referring to our impoverished sens- sensation that you know we don't we don't even get all the pixels in deep into our brains, right? Because we filter them out so much. Correct. That that's very true. 
Uh, and of course, we get it, uh, as you know, in a very different way than, yes. <laughs> you know, via psychotic system and so on. And so it's important to look at um, the papers in, in, you know, psychophysics and neuroscience because they do sort of guide uh, the design of AI systems. And what we build might not be like anything that the brain does. It likely will be uh, more efficient mm. uh, and so. it, will, it will be different. But if we go back, I mean, a few years ago, I had the, the fortune, actually, I kind of want to do a shout out here to uh, Professor Fukushima, who gave us the new cognitor, yeah. um, who I think probably deserves a lot more recognition <laughs> for his amazing work. So I met him in, uh, in Japan. I had the fortune of attending a meeting there four years ago, and I had dinner with him. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, you know, a lovely man probably in his 80s, I'm not sure, um, um, but he's sort of still very upbeat and, you know, he was drinking Sapporo with me and so on. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked him, how did he come up with the new cognitor? And he mentioned he worked in a research lab where there were neuroscientists and uh, they explained to him uh, the Hubble and Wiesel model. And then it was inspired by the findings of neuroscientists that he went and he started hard coding, you know, more or less what uh what, what would be the you know the first stage or second stage of uh, in v1 and so he thought of uh, the you know the convolutions and the pooling mm -hmm. and he added the relo units uh, which have been rediscovered right and uh and of course he had some sort of learning rule which was competitive and that's basically the one of the big success story of learning the convolutional network architecture right of course, it later was refined by Jan de Kuhn by with automatic differentiation. So that was an important advancement as well. But I think that sort of there's a clear thread there of how neuroscience inspired this. The other workhorse out there in um, has been LSTMs, and once again they were sort of inspired by cortical circuits. Right. <laughs> and uh, so what gets produced at, at the end is perhaps a model of a neuron that's not quite like a cortical neuron, but it nonetheless drew inspiration from uh, that literature. And finally, there's the models of attention. Uh, again, there's been a lot of literature in cognitive science and attention and so on, and that also has sort of somewhat motivated. Having said this, I don't want to say that everything that is out there in cognitive science and so on, <laughs> there, there's also a lot of, quite often, and, and this is where the engineering matters to me. So the inspiration matters. But at the end of the day, you have to build it. You have to have a way of measuring performance. And you have to make sure it works. Mm. So what I don't like is when people build these, propose these huge models of how the attention works and how awareness in the brain, in, you mean? Play, uh, in the brain, say. Yeah. And then there's no experiments. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a proposal or the experiment is like a really tiny thing that it's not compelling enough. You don't like so thought experiments? <laughs> uh, so I, I think those are useful. It's yeah. useful to have paper. I mean, in fact, the original papers on STMs and so on were of that nature. The experiments weren't that developed. There, was, there were ideas uh, that proved to be useful. But quite often we have People build the systems with, you know, boxes and so on, and attention feeds into awareness, and awareness feeds into perception, motor control, and it leaves a lot of detail, and that's important <laughs> detail, and um, that annoys the deep learning crowd, <laughs> and uh, with some reason. Interesting. Um, although it's, of course, that we need to strike a balance. I think we need both things. We need sort of inspiration, but we also need execution and measurement. Blake, Jeliak, Sevan, thank you so much for supporting the show through Patreon. I'm going to be producing some content soon that I will share with you as a Patreon supporter, and I look forward to getting your valuable feedback on it. So stay tuned, Patreon supporters. If you, dear listener, would like to be a part of that, you can support the show for a mere couple bucks per month. Go to braininspired.co and hit the red Patreon button there.
So when just in your day-to-day sort of workflow, when you're thinking about how to make an algorithm work or how to build certain modules to work together, for instance, you know, how much of your time is spent thinking on the engineering side and on the statistical side versus like how brains might do it? Is it constrained at all thinking about that? Or, or is that just something like, well, I, you take the inspiration from what you've, a few papers you've read, and then you're back into your engineering world. And I'm not trying to, you know, pin you down at all. I, I, I'm just genuinely curious. So, so I'll mention this one example because it's it's, it's very recent. It's mm. one of the things that's in my mind right now. One of the problems I'm trying to solve. So the inspiration here is, if I ask you, and I'm going to ask you, do you know what a tufa is? I do because I've read because you've watched yeah, watched yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so okay, so you know what a tufa is, uh, but you can uh, explain it for the listeners. I'm an expert in tufas, of course, but uh, I yeah. I'm gonna leave it to you to explain <laughs> okay. what a tufa is. Okay. <laughs> Will you? <laughs> oh no! So my understanding of it, um, I I thought okay, I'll put that in the introduction. Uh, my understanding of a tufa is well, I know what it looks like from what I've seen, if I if I'm remembering correctly. So uh, there's this. Uh, sort of an arrow shape as a three-dimensional shape, and I've only seen them in black and white, unless I'm remembering incorrectly. I, I don't know the function of the tufa. I only know the way it appears. Uh, that's pretty much it. So Josh Tenenbaum, when he gives these, uh, this talk, he always shows images of tufas. So he shows the images of a bunch of things that are sort of alien mushrooms. <laughs> and then that, that are says, all pretty similar looking. Yeah. Yes, and then he says, these two are tufas. And then he shows you another one, and he asks you, is that a tooth or not? And people are very quick to right. uh, identify what a tooth is. But I could also ask you, do you know what a scripnik is? Uh, no. Okay. So basically what I'm doing with you right now uh, at a meta level is I've asked you about two first and script next. You know what a two is. You have some sort of idea of what it is. You can give an explanation of what it is. Um, you also know that you don't know what a scriptnik is. So, um, because this exists, we, we've just witnessed it in this conversation, it would be interesting to enable our agents to also be able to know what they know and to know what they don't know. Now, a meta question here is why? Uh, why would we want that from agents? Mm. Um, I think... Um, one of the reasons why we want this is because we want agents to explain themselves. We want to be able to ask uh, questions of the agents and have them to explain to us why they chose uh, a, why they made a particular decision. Especially with RL agents, we, we, we watch them acting and it's almost impossible not to st- uh, you start humanizing them and tell- right. anthropomorphizing them and saying, you know, this agent is going to the right of the maze because, you know, she wants to grab the apple. But in effect, what tends to happen is the agent is just looking at a particular pixel pattern <laughs> on, on the roof, perhaps, right. and is using that to guide it. So it has no notion of what the apple is or and so on. Sometimes the agents do have that knowledge and and we're able to actually measure it. Uh, so we're actually, for example, if the agent uses an LSTM network, uh, we can with a linear function regress out uh, things like the orientation of the agent, the location of the agent in the maze and so on. So there's some sort of form of uh, the information is there. Mm. Uh, and sometimes it's not there. We would like to know what information is there, what is not there, even before, without us having to construct a test like this by regressing out. Sure. Um, so the natural way, I think, eventually is for us to be able to ask questions, just very much like the dialogue we just had when I asked, what is a tooth, and asked you to explain yourself, and you went back to uh, Justin and Baum's presentations and so on. So... I would like to do that with agents. So that's the, that's the inspiration part. And then comes the pragmatic part, which is like, how do I go about constructing a task uh, where this is useful? Or how can I do this? Or if, even if I don't construct a task where it's useful for an agent to know what it knows, or to know what it doesn't know, which is quite hard actually to do. Well, it's, um, it's, it's difficult for humans too, because we're t- notoriously inaccurate in our own metacognitive awareness, let's say, on our own metacognition. Very much so. 
And so, but the simplest thing I can do is maybe start figuring out a question answering system where mm. I can sort of ask the agent questions or ask an agent to explain itself. And that quickly leads you into making sure that whatever you do with language in, in these networks doesn't confound with the knowledge that's in the agent. So mm-hmm. you start getting into the pragmatics of the, how you construct the neural networks and so on, how you train them. Um, it also then leads to the question of how do you ensure that the agents are truthful? <laughs> and so you start, you invariably end up in the world of causality and counterfactual reasoning and so on and tests. And and so you start going in that route. So basically, so you start with a big grand vision. Um, you sort of think of something that would be nice. It would be nice to have tasks for which it's clear that it's useful for agents to know what they don't know and so on. But then that turns out to be quite hard. Um, then you might then take a step back uh, to something that's a bit more feasible, uh, like maybe it's just a simple question answering system that asks the agent, um, how far are you from uh, the wall and so on? And you could try to think of how to construct a data set uh, for this and, uh, and try to think of how to train an agent to, to do this type of work. Um, and so this is work that actually some of uh, uh, the folks that work with me, some of my collaborators have been doing. Um, so it, it's you sort of try to go back and try to find a way, a problem that you can attack. Um, you t- have to figure out a way of measuring performance. And uh, so d- d- defining clearly what your goals are, uh, how will you know that you will succeed or not with your research. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, and, and also have some de-risking strategy. If you go too, uh, for something too ambitious, you might not succeed. So sometimes it's, it's also good to have some uh, simple, simpler goals or, or sort of more achievable goals. And, and make sure that you can achieve uh, uh, those goals. So de-risking is important. And of course, then there's all the other things that are sort of obvious, which is you should be thinking of baselines and so on. So it, it was really difficult actually preparing to talk to you because you've done so much recently in, in so many facets. But sort of the overarching theme that I've seen in the recent few years of, of the work that you've put out on, on archive and, and other venues has been, in my mind, it's been sort of expanding AI beyond its narrow ability to do a few things extremely well. And I guess generalization is the word that seems to tie all of your different facets of work together. And so so would you say that's accurate? And then what would you say is the most critical question that intrigues you right now? Is it this idea of teaching machines to learn what they do and don't know? Or is it a meta-learning uh, drive? Yeah, I think one of the questions that interests me the most right now is the meta-learning question, um, because it's about how will agents perform in different environments? Uh, how do they perform when their bodies are slightly different? Because every time we wake up, our bodies are slightly different, <laughs> depending on how well we slept and so on. Yeah. Um, but we, we don't even perceive that. But if you if you work with uh, in a robotics lab, then you become aware of this very quickly <laughs> because you you realize that if you collect data one week and then with deterioration uh, a few months later, you try to test the policy that you learned before and it fails mm. because maybe there's dust now in the joints of the robot or hysteresis or something like that. Um, so agents are adaptive, and we live in non-stationary worlds. So our worlds keep changing. And so we're adapting over time to new tasks. So you can think of you can think of the nest non stationarity of the world as multiple as many tasks. And then of course there's also a parallel aspect to it. Um, if you think of like say now going to agents as populations, if you think of how we do hospitals, I mean well, whatever treatments we do in different hospitals should inform um, the treatments that say a nation should follow up if one hospital sort of doing better or mm. what data they're gathering um, the summary statistics should go to the um, to the nation if, if there's a national something like the NHS they can come up with a better update a meta update and then distribute it back to their hospitals right. and then this process keeps going on and also with time um, so having things in parallel and sequentially 
are very natural. And, and in fact, this is what hierarchical base was sort of developed for and has worked very well at it. And for now, several decades with the basis of decisions. I think with meta learning now, with the neural networks and automatic differentiation, we've been able to do a lot of new exciting things uh, in terms of um, uh, you know learning loss functions automatically, learning uh, optimizers, learning networks, learning new architectures. Um, there's a lot of fascinating stuff going on. And a lot of it is about also using data to perhaps learn some inductive biases that mm -hmm. allow you to learn faster. Um, but it's also about trying to figure out what are the inductive biases that will allow you to learn something in one domain and then some, say, pockets of knowledge and then be able to take some of these pockets of knowledge to solve a new task. Mm -hmm. And machine learning traditionally has dealt with the approach that there is smoothness in the data and that's essentially uh you know so if, if you're uh, so the idea is that you train in your training data you test in your you know t t in your validation sets and so on and then you hope that um this model will transfer to will also do well in the test set so you, you you're intrinsically there is a an assumption of smoothness in the function spaces here but what we're now after is not just about training a classifier, but rather we want to learn multiple neural networks, say, or multiple modules of knowledge. And then we want to transfer some of these, reuse some of these. The useful uh, parts. Right? Correct. So repurpose some of these pockets of knowledge. And of course, this will be context dependent. In, in a context, you, some knowledge will be useful. In another context, a different type of knowledge will be useful. And every time we go into a new environment, there's an opportunity to learn new modules with which we can add to our sort of big system of modules. So here, there's, there's a clear inductive bias I'm talking about, which is modularity. But I think this is an important one, especially if we start thinking of independent mo modules of knowledge, then it starts tying also with the work on causality. We want to learn, say, physical laws um, like uh, invariant mechanisms, uh, mechanisms that would work across many environments mm -hmm. and then be able to sort of repurpose these mechanisms to build larger systems of thought to, to, to solve new tasks. That, I think, is one of the most fundamental questions uh, going on in science right now is this question of adaptability. And, and in particular, I want it to be fast as well. Sure. Uh, I, I think a key thing is that I don't want to go to a new environment and then have to spend a lot of time learning. No, I want to do this quickly, the way humans do. Sort of, um, and I think that's what meta learning buys us to a large extent is this idea to do, to be able to do fast inference or fast imitation, just with a bit of data, with one demonstration, for example, you can do the task, or with a language description, that's enough to do the task. So it becomes easy to adapt the agent as well. So the agent is adaptive, but you can also, just by providing a little bit of uh, data, you could adapt the agent to do something new. So this is so, uh, exactly what you've done with your MetaMimic work, um, using imitation as a strategy to, to use this one-shot learning or few-shot uh, learning to imitate what an agent sees on YouTube, for instance, or from another agent to then... Uh, mimic that process. So this is exactly the, the work that you've been doing. And I know that we're we're going to come up against time pretty soon here. So mm -hmm. instead of diving deep into your actual research in the papers, what I'm going to do is point to a bunch of them that have this kind of common thread that you've uh, already alluded to a lot. I'm uh, sorry to interrupt you, by the way, but mm -hmm. you, you've yep. alluded to a lot just in, in the course of your thinking out loud, sort of. So to get at this, First of all, you're giving a, a keynote uh, address at the Cognitive Computational Neuroscience Conference in Berlin uh, in a few months. And, you know, this brings together neuroscientists and AI researchers. What are a few of the topics that you might talk about at CC? And I know it's really early yet and things happen so quickly, but do you think it might be about the, this meta learning? Push? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I still haven't decided what okay. I'm going to talk about, but I think meta learning would be a good topic <laughs> good. because it is a topic that uh, is of interest to cognitive scientists and neuroscientists uh, at large. 
I mean, there's a there's interesting in uh, causation now. Right. Uh, there's an interest in uh, learning with few data. You know, being able to do uh, fast inference, um, and of course. A lot of the meta learning was largely again inspired by works done in uh, psychology. You know, with people seeing how quickly, say, monkeys will uh, learn the meta task when they're doing uh, specific tasks. You know, the work of Harlow, which I don't have the time to describe here. That's okay. I'll refer people. Um, I, had, I had Matt Botvinnik on the show, so we talked about his meta learning work, mm-hmm. and then we talked about the Harlow experiments during that episode as well. So. Yeah, and actually, I I I'm always chatting with Matt, so that's a good example of that sort of. Um, I guess what Fukushima had in Japan back in the '60s or '70s is something I have nowadays um, here at DeepMind because I, I I get a chance to work and collaborate with Matt on some of the meta learning projects, and and you know I find that to be extremely uh, useful and then enlightening. <laughs> yeah, well, how do you? How do you think that, you know, so Matt's sort of from a psychology neuroscience background, but he's also been in the machine learning world a long time. But you know, at, at a conference at something like CCN, it brings together these different people from different backgrounds and expertise. How can cognitive science and computational neuroscience and artificial intelligence best work together, you think, now that you're in this sort of boiling cauldron at DeepMind where that's kind of happening? I think we just need to keep talking to each other. Uh, we need to listen to each other's presentations. And even if all what you get is 10% of the presentation, <laughs> and then you can always get together and have lunch uh, with people in the other field. Sapporo. And you can ask questions. <laughs> Does it, yeah, perhaps with Sapporo or in, in Berlin. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's right. In Berlin, but <laughs> um, there's always a way to engage with other people in which you actually can get to learn a lot. And and this pretty much has been what we've done at CIFR for the last 20 years. Um, mm-hmm. So CIFR always brings neuroscientists and cognitive scientists and um, uh, machine learning researchers together. And then we discuss, uh, you know, we have presentations and then most of the meetings are actually used for discussions where... Um, where you get to learn a lot. You know, I go for, so for example, uh, one of the people who I enjoy going out, uh, you know, for lunch is uh, Bruno Schausen. Uh, sure. And uh, I mean, it's fascinating. You learn all about, you know, like the experiments that people do with uh, trying to, uh, you know, deal with uh, insect brains and so on. Yeah. And, and the issues with, you know, sometimes you just learn about, you know, like all the sort of experimental issues that they might have with, say, the brains not exploding when they're trying to <laughs> sort of analyze the brain, That's try to funny. open the brain of a fly or something. Right, right. And so these are things I don't usually think about. So being able to sit down with Bruno and talk about uh, jumping spiders and learn all, all the many amazing things that uh, humbling mm. <laughs> things that a jumping spider can do is just fascinating and uh, or learn more about the understanding that neuroscientists have of a single cell in v1 and also be able to get a good grasp of the difference between um, findings that are based on a monkey sitting in a lab versus, uh, you know, an animal that runs freely uh, on the fields. I think that that's very important. Occasionally engaging also with neuroscientists in labs and experiments is also useful. Um, so I, I had a pleasure of doing that uh, with some neuroscientists when I was at UBC in Vancouver. Uh, and then you go there and you see what kind of measurements they're getting of uh, their uh, neuron readings, but you also see the measurement system that they have in terms of cameras and so on to mm. be able to track, uh, say, uh, a rat. And then you realize, wow, you've invested a lot on these chips to measure neurons, but you're using such a simple tracker to track this rat. <laughs> and you're trying to infer some something deep about the hippocampus 
but your sort of visual data is so poor, uh, you know, and maybe what's really happening here is not as right as planning which buttons to press, but just how to escape this cage. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> so it's yeah. useful to, like, I wouldn't, you know, to be able to sort of understand what neuroscientists do, it's really important to actually have these meetings with them and to engage with them. You know, and and vice versa. I think, and 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 chastise them for using such crazy methods to measure things. <laughs> but, but, but that would have been chastised. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's more understanding better where the data comes from, um, so that uh, we just don't go and blindly start analyzing it, but we actually have a a better understanding of the difficulties that they face. Because in doing that, actually, what you learn is that. Well, they're using those methods, but that's because we haven't provided them with better methods. And right. so in a way, we, we're the ones that are at fault for not having given them better computer vision systems <laughs> that they could use to track, uh, you know, the rats, and let's say 3D frames. Wes. Yeah. What do you think is the neural basis of consciousness? What is consciousness? Nora, what do you think the neural basis of consciousness is? What does that even mean? (laughs) Bringing that back to the... You know, I asked you what um, what is most intriguing to you, and you, and you talked about meta learning. What do you think that we need more of to understand these things? Do you think that we need better technology? Do you think we need better or more data, or better models, for instance, or theories? I think we need to be able to train agents in many diverse environments. So this is one thing that has been missing. We often design for a specific task. And we're very good at doing that. We're very good at designing an agent to play Go. We're very good at designing an agent to uh, to classify images or to do speech uh, recognition. But if we try to think of designing agents capable of a wide range of tasks, then th- that turns out to be very hard. So that's, that's certainly something that we need a lot more. Um, the other thing is there are... Things that are not essential to, I think, what we would define as maybe intelligence or understanding the brain, but things like motor control, which I still think are very important nonetheless. And for me, I think that we should, uh, for me, no satisfying understanding of of the nervous system is accomplished until we understand motor control. Mm. And so uh, it's not enough, but it's essential. Uh, it's, It's sort of a requirement for me. And we are very far from that. I mean, we, we don't know how to build a machine that is capable of tying shoelaces and at the same time being able to chop an apple and be able to fold a towel and be able to do a variety of things that a three-year-old does. Right. <laughs> Actually, no, I take it back. My, my three-year-old doesn't tie shoelaces. I think it takes yeah. about six years for humans to learn to do that, if not more. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's actually a very hard task. Um, so, and in that sense, what's missing there is we still don't have good robotic uh, sort of hardware. Mm. Uh, the hardware is coming along. We uh, we still don't have good ways. Uh, machine learning hasn't really hit robotics uh, as uh, as it should either. Um, so I think we're still far from. And and what what why that is interesting is because if we could do machine learning with actually real robots and so on, it's very easy to sort of create many tasks in in a real system. Um, except that the tasks that will uh, require uh, that you run them in real time, mm. so sample complexity is something we would need to address. And this is where I think meta learning also comes in. Simulation allows us to run things thousands of times faster than real time, so we can do a lot more experiments. <laughs> uh, so we, we don't need to care about sample complexity. Um, but I think that's a bit of a trap. And it's useful for a lot of things and might allow us to see to solve some problems that we, uh, we're not solving uh, because we, we haven't solved sample complexity and meta learning. But it nonetheless, 
is a trap in terms of uh, we not being able to solve lots of tasks with few data. Yeah. So when you're sitting down with like a neuroscientist, a, a Bruno Olshausen or, or a Matt Botvinnik or something, you know, what is what are you looking for from the neuroscience side? What What is something important that you think that neuroscience will or can contribute uh, to AI? And and how much neuroscience is is the right amount for AI? You know, this goes back to, you know, what you were just talking about with simulating and, and how some things are necessary, but not sufficient and, and so on. I guess when I talk to neuroscientists, what I'm looking for is inspiration. And, and in a way, when I sit down with Bruno, it's, the, you know, the first question I ask him was, okay, so what's the latest? What's new? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's he, new? Asked, he asked you the same thing probably, right? <laughs> yeah, and you just want to find out, okay, uh, maybe there's this new finding that's very interesting, and this means that we now have a good chance of uh, finally understanding, uh, I don't know, the, the role of top-down processing and perception, <laughs> mm. something like that. What's some historical... Something historical that's not mainstream, an idea or a body of, of work that you think that neuroscience, or in your case, really more machine learning or, or AI, needs to be paying more attention to? I think we're paying attention to a lot of important problems right now. It's hard to pinpoint things that are sort of being underestimated. One that I think and this was true of it uh, two years ago, but fortunately the, it's been corrected, is counterfactual reasoning, yeah. uh, causal thinking. Um, but now that has hit um, uh, deep learning as well, so folks are thinking about that. Um, I think that's very important, not just because of societal reasons and bias and all that, but because I think it's essential to build such systems into the agents I think that's also essential to understand like independent mechanisms and so on, as Bernard Shawkov and, and his team have been doing, which is what also will allow us to get agents that sort of generalize uh, with fewer data, uh, with fewer resources, and that re reuse and repurpose their knowledge. So I know that you are interested in consciousness and awareness, and you've <clears throat> done some work on showing that the internal states of... Um, like recurrent neural networks are maintained over time, so they have some sense of internal awareness in that regard. You've used change blindness uh, to demonstrate how bad we are at introspecting about our own minds. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that, but my, my question is, will our poor introspection thwart our uh, progress in AI in understanding our own minds? Are we going to uh, get in our own way, you know? Definitely, I would say. I mean, that that's basically much of the history of AI is we, we believe some things are hard and they turn out to be easy and things that we think are easy turn out to be hard. Is We're really bad judges. Terrible. Of how we think or <laughs> what is hard and what is easy. So I, I do believe strongly in, in, in that. And I'm trying to see, and you're probably right, I might be contradicting myself here because uh, I do believe in change blindness. I mean, I think that's very clear, the, 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 there's data. But I also know that, that there are that I know what a Tufa is, and uh, I don't know what a Skripnik is. I just made up that word a few minutes ago. Oh, well, I was wondering, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so there are things I know, and there's things I don't know. Uh, and that's sort of useful knowledge. And and knowing about my body, knowing about what I can do with my body, knowing about that helps me because it will help me, I don't know, choose my pose, make sure that I'm looking at you when we're talking and so on. So I think that also is an important part of the puzzle. I think we do have some awareness uh, of uh, external things to us, of uh, our bodies and of our thoughts. Some more than others. <laughs> um, Your dog, not my dog. <laughs> <laughs> so it's something that I think we need to study and we need to understand because it's also kind of what allows us to explain ourselves and it's tied with explanation and causation. So I think it's an important, it's an important problem that we can study and it's grounded. It's a scientific problem. So I'm not interested in the sort of metaphysical awareness or the Mm -hmm. Our problem of sort of consciousness and so on, but I'm more sort of, sort of thinking of the 
I can't remember how Chalmers calls it. Is it the, the weak one or the, the, the easy, easy one? Easy, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it it is perfectly feasible to build, uh, and I think we just haven't done it, but to sort of uh, build a machine that, sh- that is aware of what it knows and what it doesn't know, that has a model of what it knows. A model uh, of what it knows. So, yeah, this is, it gets murky because what do we mean by aware and et cetera, et cetera. And I, you, you've mentioned the attention schema theory of awareness. Mm-hmm. I'm actually reading that book by Graziano right now. And so far it hasn't really touched the hard problem, but you're not interested in the hard problem. And so, so much of this is just moving the goalposts and understanding what it is we're actually defining and talking about. So um, anyway. Yeah, and I'm trying not to call it just a name and leave it there yeah. because and it can be anything really. It's uh, right. you have um, to define it computationally, right? Correct. So we're we're terrible introspectors. We're also terrible at prediction, longer term prediction, right? We don't have flying cars and such yet. Mm-hmm. Um, so <laughs> so a hundred years from now, Nando, what, how will people write about this era in AI? It certainly was a turning point. Uh, no doubt, people will see this was a turning point. Is there another AI winter uh, coming? Uh, I don't know if there's more winters coming, but uh, uh, this was definitely a turning point. Um, uh, I think in technology and everything. Um, I think in my lifetime, I've gone from um, there were no personal computers to everyone carries one in their pockets, almost throughout the entire planet. There's as many of these computers as there are humans. Now. And there w- it was predicted uh, by early computer manufacturers that no one would even want a, a personal computer. Speaking of how poor we are at predicting. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I don't know if they were thinking of iPhones, but you know, I, I still remember when the first one came out, and that wasn't long ago. And right. look how dramatically it has changed the world. And how people behave as well. <laughs> oh, we behave so much better now, don't we? No, no. <laughs> in some ways, yes, yeah. uh, and in some ways, not. I think that's part of where we we sort of seeing ripples, and hopefully, we will uh, adjust and sort of uh, keep the good things of the techno- uh, finding new technology and learn to uh, put aside the things that are not really useful to us in yeah. the long. This is a, a challenge. Finally, Nando, I know you have to go. What is something that you used to believe that you find naive now? Oh, that's a good question. Oh, this one does get metaphysical. (laughs) Yeah, great. (laughs) I'm trying to think of something technical. Um, One that comes to mind on, on a technical front is during my thesis, I started, you know, I was doing neural networks and then I was estimating the hyperparameters by gradient descent. So I built these sort of hierarchical systems where everything gets got to be estimated by gradient descent. Mm-hmm. And then I abandoned that work because I felt like it wasn't like <laughs> fancy enough or it wasn't like proper. <laughs> And I I started doing a lot of work on interacting uh, particle systems, you know, sequential Monte Carlo and so yeah. on, because um, it was cool. You could learn a lot about probability. And then, and then there was this esoteric thing called measure theory that I got into learning. And, you know, and I started learning about super martingales and I started learning about, uh, you know, measurability and so on. And then you could build these interacting particle systems, train your neural networks, and you know they would learn the number of neurons of the neural networks mm-hmm. and and learn how many neurons it has. It would learn the hyperparameters. It would learn wow. the entire neural network, and we do this online. Wow! And that to me was like we just need to keep scaling this. It's parallel. So I believed in going essentially going um being enamored by mathematics uh, being enamored by this idea that you could just scale it easily <laughs> uh, by having more compute and that took me away from the gradient approach which is the one that has succeeded now so far um, so far <laughs> i might still be wrong on this but but it's clearly the case that if you 
and and it's interesting that I bring this sort of the the sort of being enamored by mathematics or the sort of asymptotic computation as opposed to sort of finite resources and mm. making trade-offs. Um, because clearly those things have been useful to me, you know, throughout, you know, I still use mathematics to derive some of the meta learning algorithms and so on. So these tools are extremely useful in my thinking and so on. Um, and likewise, um, thinking about sort of scale and how algorithms do asymptotically is useful. Um, you want them to be at least sublinear and so on in, in any resource communication or storage or, or mm -hmm. computation. But what I wasn't thinking about was like, what are the finite resources that we have? Yeah. You know, there, there's some very practical limits as to what we can do and that I should be designing guided by those practical limits. And instead of trying to go with the thing that's fancy and thing of the future and all that, sometimes it's good to just pick the one that you really know works <laughs> and just work a little on making it better. Oh, I like it. Well, Nando, thank you for taking the time. Um, I know time is always short for busy and successful people. Why do you have to be so successful and busy? Why can't we talk for another hour? But anyway, <laughs> thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this opportunity. Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. You can support the show through Patreon for a microscopic two or four dollars per month. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. Your contribution will help sustain and improve the show and prohibit any annoying advertisements like you hear on other shows. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thanks for your support. See you next time. Man.